<laughs> All right, I'm, I'm leaving my inner critic over there somewhere. Um, hello. Oh, this is big. Um, so yeah, I'm Kate. I'm a civil servant. Uh, I'm from the government, the UK government. I don't work in this building, unfortunately. Um, I, I read, actually, the other day that um, the Hungarian Houses of Parliament is based off of our one, but it's slightly bigger and slightly better, so well done. You win that one. Um, but I don't work in this building. Uh, I work in this slightly more shiny, uh, slightly more hipster building, and I work for the Government Digital Service. Um, I'll call it GDS uh, throughout the talk, because we love an acronym in government. Um, we're part of the Cabinet Office, which is one of the UK's 25 ministerial departments. Um, and we're currently about 800 people at GDS. And that's designers like myself, it's developers, product managers, writers, um, policy people, uh, lo lots more. And we work mostly in agile teams, uh, multidisciplinary way. And everything that we do is intended to help government work better for users. So everything we do is built around user needs. And we made stickers to put on our laptops to make sure that everyone else in government knows this whenever we go and visit them. Um, among some of the things that we've done, that we've delivered, is gov.uk, which is a single website for all of the UK government. Um, so thanks for Sonongo for the shout out yesterday on this one. Um, GovUK launched in 2012. And before GovUK, each department had its own website. Um, and even the agencies and, and organizations within their departments had their own website. Um, so there was hundreds of them. Actually, uh, how many were there? We've brought 1,884 websites together. They were all slightly different, all over the place, um, and it could be really hard for users to find what they needed from government when they needed to interact with us. So we brought them together in one place, and GovUK is now home to pretty much all of, UK, of the UK government's content and digital services. So if you want to do something online with the UK government, you do it on GovUK. Um, it's won some awards, as Sonongo said yesterday, which is great. These are our Design of the Year and DNAD awards. The shelf is longer. There are more further along. We're very proud of them. We keep them in our kitchen um, at work. Um, and we're now five years old. In fact, we turn five on Tuesday, so happy birthday to us. Woo! So I didn't miss the cake, but I did miss all the alcohol yesterday, but that's okay. Um, so we're the most uh, mature digital product that, that GDS runs. This is my team. I'm in the GovUK program. Um, I'm service design lead for GovUK. And we're constantly working to improve, uh, and improve GovUK and prepare for whatever the future brings. Because GovUK is home to all of the UK government's digital content, we have to make sure that it can always, uh, that users can always access that content simpler, clearer, and faster. So, alongside GovUK, we do lots of other things. There's 800 of us. We've got to keep busy. Um, we do things like GovUK Pay. Uh, this is a payments platform that government services can use, um, plug into their, the services that they're building if they need people to pay them for something. So if a user needs to pay them when they're applying for a visa, something like that. Um, uh, another example of things that we build and run is GovUK Verify. Um, this lets people prove who, uh, that they are who they say they are to access government services. And this is really critical because we don't have uh, like identity cards or like um, social security numbers in the UK. We had a referendum that voted against it. So this is our way around that to help users identify themselves and still gain access to government services. It's really important and really hard to do. Um, and we're also working to give government the tools and infrastructure it needs to manage data. Um, so one simple example of this is the registers project. And on the screen, you can see the country register that we've set up. 
uh, which is a single source of information of all the countries in the world. Now before this, each department or even teams within departments might have had their own list of all the countries in the world. Um, they might have downloaded it from Wikipedia or somewhere, or, and they were all slightly different, they're kept inconsistently up to date, um, which obviously caused problems for users. Um, so now we have one accurate, up-to-date list with a custodian of that list who makes sure that that is up-to-date and accurate. So everyone in the UK government now knows, or should know, that Hungarians come from Hungary. Yay! <laughs> Um, so, a couple of years ago, we ran something called the Transformation Program. Um, so, not to just give government the tools, but to show that building services around user needs could improve things for those users and for government as well. So, we worked with um, projects, 25 projects, exemplars across departments um, to build those services around user needs. Um, things like renewing a patent or uh, getting student finance. And I want to show you a video that we made about one of the services we worked on called Lasting Power of Attorney. Um, so Lasting Power of Attorney, for those of you who don't know, it's a way of giving somebody you trust the legal authority to make decisions on your behalf if you lose uh, sort of mental capacity to do it yourself at some point in future or you no longer want to make those decisions. So. I'll play the film. I'll let Anne speak for herself if I can work out where my mouse is to make it play. There we go. Is it going to play? Yeah. So I'm 67, and I've done the last in the power of attorney for my, for my mother. My mum's grasp on... Uh, modern day living as it was, was a bit limited so it was decided then that I would pay all the bills, sort everything out for her. Three years ago I had a, a stroke and you start thinking about your own mortality and you start thinking about well if something had have happened to me then how would mum have coped, what would have happened. Anyway looking on the internet and I literally stumbled across the government site for the lasting power of attorney. Started to look at it and I thought, this is good, because you can download all the paperwork yourself, you don't need a solicitor. And the instructions that went with each section of the lasting power of attorney, were, they were in proper people speak, not in legal jargon, so it was very easy for me to follow it. If I can do it, anybody can do it, you know. It, it's easy. The written instructions, you just can't go wrong. And I would say now to anybody, don't be frightened. Don't worry about going to see a solicitor. Do it yourself. I'm glad I did it, and I'm glad I did it when I did it. And, uh, and my mum's really pleased. And can I say thank you? Of course you can. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to everybody involved in doing the website because it's given me peace of mind and I'm sure it gives a lot of people peace of mind. And my friend now is doing that and you've made it so simple and so easy for, for anybody to do and I just hope that anybody who sees this film please do it and you'll feel so relieved afterwards you know it's it's great to know that the people that you care for everything's looked after for them thank you Aww. I don't know how many times I've seen that film. Every time I cry. It's, oh, but like, you know, it's... Um, let me see if I can just get back to my slides. You know, a lot of the services that government provides 
are used by people in really difficult and emotionally stressful times of life. So the impact of designing these services well is massive. And the work that GDS did back then was really effective at showing the benefits of that user-focused approach, uh, redesigning services around user needs. But the work that the transformation program did only really looked at the content and the transactions in services. It looked at the front-end experience. And it didn't really tackle the end-to-end -end user journey and the systems and processes that sit behind that journey in order to deliver it to users. Things like the technology, um, the way the whole service worked, or in, because government, the way the service mostly didn't work. Um, and that's what we're looking at now, the full service design. And doing this is a massive deal, because most of government spends most of its time designing, redesigning, building, and operating services. Most of the people who work in government are involved directly or ind indirectly in delivering these services. So we're moving from redesigning front-end transactions to redesigning end-to-end -end services, services built around user needs. And I want to tell you a bit about what GDS is doing now um, to build great services for users and how we're doing that. So I'm going to do that by answering a few questions. Firstly, I'm going to tell you, what is a service? Sounds like a trick question. It's not. Um, what does a service designer do? What do I do in my day to day? Um, why is this so damn difficult? Well, spoiler alert, because government's bonkers. And <laughs> trust me. Uh, and what is GDS doing to make it easier for the rest of government to build better services? So. Let's start with an easy-ish question. What is a service anyway? Well, of course, there's a simple answer to that and a more difficult one. The simple answer is that a service is a thing that helps someone to do something, like renew a passport, register to vote, or even to go fishing. You need a license in the UK to go fishing. I don't know if this is the case in Hungary. Um, but of course, the more complicated answer is that a service also looks something like this. Uh, this is a service journey map for exporting something from the UK. Um, it's probably too small for you to read the detail. That's fine. It's really ugly anyway. But it's, uh, what you need to take away from this is that the service involves many different steps. It involves lots of different organizations from across government. It involves many different channels and touch points, so digital, phone, face-to-face, -face, letters, forms, and it's pretty long and complex. But services should be designed for users, not for government. And it's our job as service designers to make sure that this happens, to ensure that we're designing services that work easily for users, that aren't going to fall over, that are joined up properly, um, that don't have broken bits in them, and that make sense for users, not just for government. And doing this has three big benefits. It has many more, but three big ones. It's going to save time. It means that users can do the thing that they want to do more quickly. It will save effort, both for users and for the government uh, teams delivering those services. And it's going to save users and the government money. Because if people are able to deal with the government more quickly and easily, they can spend less time on the phone or responding to letters, filling in forms, or taking half a day off work to drive to Wales to renew their driving license. And then the whole economy is going to benefit as a whole. So it's really important. So what is it that a service designer does? Well, of course, there's a simple answer to that as well. Service designers design services, but, <laughs> but uh, that's not very helpful. So let's expand on that a bit. Um, a service designer is there to understand everything that goes into a service. 
So that includes all of the things that a user might see and come into contact with, but also the things that may, they might not see, like the back-end processes, the code that goes into a service. So we're there to understand how all of those things fit together and therefore how the service should be best designed uh, to meet user needs. This means that as service designers, we work with many different materials. So where a graphic designer might work with colors and font, we work with people, with processes, with products, and how they fit together, with words, and more. Um, and there are three main pillars to what we do as service designers in government, or in three main, main pillars to our skill set, sorry. Um, and the first of that is understanding the context of the full service and how it's working, and communicating that clearly to everyone involved. So we work with user researchers always uh, to find out what's going on and who's doing what, and we map that. We use things like user journey maps. Um, so we'll map out the user's current experience and the systems and processes that sit behind it. And doing this helps us define the scope of the thing that we need to address and the scope of the thing that we need to build, and to identify what's going wrong, and where we could reduce cost or complexity for the user and for government. So I'm gonna show you another uh, example from our transformation program, it's another video, uh, to give you, give you a feel of what that looks like in government. So this example's from the Home Office, and it's about some of the problems they found with the Chinese visa application process and the opportunities they saw for improving it. The visa exemplar is a project to develop a new way to apply to come to the UK from China. This year they are on track to do between 300 and 500,000 applications. We have feedback from our customer insight teams that people in China think applying for a visa is very difficult. We were really keen to start to understand why Chinese users supply enormous numbers of documents as evidence. When we walked around the embassy offices, they're literally drowning in, in paper. We went to see the travel agents. Every time they take on a new client, they send them a list of documents. They have no incentive to limit that list for users who want certainty. Um, around what documents to supply and how to negotiate the, the process of applying for an application. We're not providing it, um, but travel agents are, but it's just a very long list. But they do at least say to their clients, send these in and you've got a pretty good chance of, of, of getting a visa. So that was what was fascinating to us as well, to see a very clear reason for people using third parties um, to go through this process. The other big reason that they use them is that they don't speak English. The difference with the visa service is it translates the entire service. Users really appreciated that. We actually have some very clear pointers from our trip that, that tell us which documents are being used in the decision-making process. So our recommendation will be to limit those, the list of documents to those and, and, and be very clear to, to Chinese users that they don't need to send us the rest of them. All that paper, ridiculous. Uh, so yeah, we're saving space as well as time, effort, and money. Uh, so the second core skill of a service designer is facilitating collaboration. That's a bit of a tongue twister. There's a lot of L's. But um, this is about understanding who's involved in delivering a service and creating an environment where those people can design that service together. So we frame problems and we get the right people in a room and we give them t the tools to think about how we could approach things differently. So for example, the image in the background here, this is a workshop I ran uh, with the Department for Work and Pensions about redesigning the guidance they have around pensions on GovUK. And in that room we had policy people we had content designers, we had user researchers, we had interaction designers, and we had frontline staff. This lady in red, she works in the pensions call center, so she spends all day, every day, talking to users. And we gave them scenarios and questions that users had that we found out during our research, 
and we got the team to pick, the, pick up those scenarios and map out new journeys, new content journeys, new guidance journeys that could better ans answer the questions that users had, the real questions that users had. Um, and I couldn't have done that on my own. You know, all those different perspectives in the room made that thing so much better. Um, we're also good at prototyping. That's our third core skill. Um, pulling the team's ideas together into something that's tangible, that can be tested to see if it works. Um, whether that's prototyping a letter, or a digital interface, or even a conversation that a user might have with someone in a call center. Um, so this chart shows uh, the different design and development, development roles that we have at GDS and who focuses on what. So you can see that we broadly, we focus on the journey, the sort of process flow, and the purpose of the organization and the services that, and how the services it delivers come together to, to answer that purpose. Um, but our work overlaps with many others, notably interaction designers, content designers and user researchers. I'm just going to explain what a content designer is because I don't know whether, I think we invented it. Basically, when, when, we start, when GDS started, there was a lot of people in government who, who wrote a lot of words. We didn't necessarily think that they were sort of working in the right way, so we invented a new job so that we could bring in new people to come in differently and make sure that those people were able to focus on user needs and weren't tied to the old way of doing things. So we have content designer as a separate role. Um, but the reality is that all of these people, all of these designers who work across all of the different teams that we have, um, are always thinking about user needs. Our number one design principle is start with user needs. So we're all doing that. We're all on the same team. Um, so in case you hadn't noticed yet, it takes more than just service designers to design services. But we help that process happen. So hopefully all this sounds quite logical so far, maybe even straightforward. Some of you are probably thinking, that doesn't sound very difficult. What's the catch? What are the challenges? Well, in the UK government, the main challenges are that it's very big, really old, and definitely not set up to deliver services. So, let's go back in time. The man standing in the middle of this picture, in, of this picture with his hand on his hip, that is Sir Charles Trevelyan. And with his colleague, Stafford Northcote, he wrote the report that led to the creation of the UK Civil Service. That was back in 1854, 163 years ago. Civil servants look a little bit different now. Cue the very staged photograph. Uh, we're less extravagant sideburns, more fancy trainers, but there are still a lot of beards around. Um, <laughs> but a lot of the principles from the Northcote Trevelyan report uh, still influence how we work today. Um, the grading of roles, for example, in the civil servant, uh, comes from that report, and as do our core values of integrity and objectivity. So we're not tied to party politics, thankfully. I don't get involved in that. Um, but that means a lot of the context and principles and even the way that we work, or, uh, the structure of government, is pretty old. Um, and so a lot of the services that we provide, from, legis from the legislation that shapes those services to the technology that they're built on, and government is really big as well. So this figure is from last year's census, and it shows that there's more than 400,000 people working in the civil service across 25 different departments. That's 400,000 people doing a huge range of different jobs, from permanent secretaries, which is the government jargony term for the big bosses in charge of departments, to people working on the front line in job centers, meeting the British public day to day. Um, being a big organization and an old organization is hard enough, but actually the main challenge is that government is set up in silos. Yay! 
Yay. Um, so each of these acronyms represents a different department in government. Uh, and they might do things slightly differently or sometimes a lot differently to each other. So they might be set up to make things simpler for government, but that doesn't make any sense to users. Because if you want to do something with government, you shouldn't have to know which of these blobs you need to interact with or go to to find the information that you need. And often, when you're trying to do something, you need to speak to multiple departments. So if you're trying to set up a business, for example, you need to deal with DWP, that's Department for Work and Pensions, and HMRC, these are the guys that, that take our taxes, at a minimum, and then more depending on what business you're trying to set up. Um, and these departments aren't set up to work together. Those divisions are very real. Um, and they don't work in a way to make that process of dealing with them simple for users. And these silos exist within departments as well. <laughs> Oh my God, um, there's lots of pe different people working in departments involved in running a service. Policy people, strategy people, operations people, data people, digital people. And they are not able to, they're not set up in a way that enables them to work collaboratively on the thing. Um, sometimes they might not even know that they are working on two sides of the same thing even within departments. And so, and all of these people across all of these silos are in charge of little bits and pieces that make up users' end-to-end -end journeys. And those little bits and pieces are created in isolation of each other without understanding the context of the whole and how they fit into a user's journey. So this is how government actually sees services. Things like this, RIDOR, another great acronym. This is a document that requires employers to report serious accidents at work. Uh, or they might look like this, the employer ownership of skills. Any clue what that is? Uh, uh, it's actually a fund open to employers in England to invest in their current and future workforce. This one's a really good one. Any clue? The request for a further search under section 17.6 or payment for a supplementary certificate under section 17.8. No? This is an action related to applying for a patent for something. Obviously, not obviously. Um, or statutory off-road vehicle notification, brackets, SORN. An acronym so entrenched that people now use it as a verb. I'm going to sawn my car. No, you're not. You want to take your car off the road and stop paying tax for it. Call it that. I will kill sawn eventually. It's one of my missions. Ever since I started, I'm going to kill it, but it's, I'm not there yet. Um, because, you know, users don't see services like this. They see them in the context of the things that they want to do. Things like start a business buy a car, employ someone, look after children. To a user, a service is simple. It's a verb. It's something that they're trying to do. It's not a noun that government has created in order to categorize something. So my boss, Lou Down, who's head of design for the UK government, um, it's pretty cool that we have one of those, eh? Um, she describes service design in government as being like archaeology. It's about digging around back in time, finding all the different bits and pieces that make up a service, working out how all of those pieces fit together. And only once we've done that can we find out who we should be talking to and together start to redesign how that service should work to better meet user needs. So service design might sound pretty logical and straightforward. It's not complicated, but it is damn hard, particularly in government, which is the country's biggest and oldest service provider. So I'll finish up by talking a bit about what GDS is doing now to help with all of this. Put simply, there's always a simple. <laughs> uh, put simply, we're doing the hard work to make it simple for government to deliver services. There's two main ways that we're doing this. 
Firstly, we're giving teams across government the tools, the skills, the guidance they need to build great services. And secondly, we're figuring out how GovUK as a platform works better to, deli to deliver these services to users. That's the bit that I'm working on. So I'm part of a team, and hopefully, I told them they should watch, so hopefully they're watching the live stream. So hey team, um, we're looking at how do we model service journeys out of all those bits and pieces that get published and put on GovUK. Um, because we know that doing long, complex tasks like starting a business or learning to drive will require users to find multiple bits of content and transactions that might be owned by those siloed bits of, de of departments, and, and then they need to complete those things in the right order at the right time. So what we want to do is map out what these service journeys look like and then create a pattern for a service page that will show users all the steps in that process and help them to do all the things that they need to do. And this service model should also help departments to actually see how their stuff fits into all the other stuff and figure out what they might need to improve to make that end-to-end -end journey better. So that's really cool. So this is some of our original mapping. Um, this is the learning to drive journey and all the content and transactions on GovUK that make up that journey. Um, that's me. Uh, we're prototyping this at the moment, and we're hoping to roll out a public beta in the next couple of weeks. It's very exciting. Um, and then and we're also starting to explore more complex services. So learning to drive is pretty logical. It's quite a straightforward process that people are quite familiar with. But we need to figure out how those more complicated processes, uh, like how do, how do we support those? How do they interconnect? And, and how does the pattern facilitate that? Um, and we're also starting to think beyond GovUK too, which is pretty cool, uh, thinking into the future about how this model for services might be used by other platforms like voice interfaces so that users can navigate through services in a way that makes sense for them, not just now, but you know, in 10 years' time. So yeah, this is me at a recent GDS all staff event. We've got 800 people, so we need to communicate a lot about what we're doing in our different teams so that we don't become too siloed. I look like I've just won first prize at a science fair. <laughs> but I'm, you know, I'm genuinely really excited about this work. It's taken two years of groundwork to get to the point where we're, we're able to do this project and start thinking about these things in the GovUK team. And I'm really excited for what this means for what GDS can do and what, what it will enable government to do and, and how it will improve things for users. So I didn't, maybe I did win first prize, yeah. <laughs> um, um, but as well as all the stuff that I'm doing with my team, uh, GDS provides lots and lots of tools for government. Uh, some of them I showed you earlier, like GovUK Pay, GovUK Verify, the data registers. There's loads of stuff. So uh, earlier this year, we put together this. This is the service toolkit. It links to all of the things that GDS help, um, provides to help government teams build and run services. Uh, it's open to the public. So you can go off and look at it right now, if you wish, um, and explore it for yourself. Actually, being open is another one of our design principles. Being, be open because it makes things better. Because the more eyes on the thing, the more it challenges us to improve it. Um, so that's great, although I'm, I'm not going to lie. It's, n it's not been without issue, because we're open with our code and our design styles. I don't know how many different Ministry of Magic pages have been created, and it's like whack-a-mole. Every time we get rid of a Ministry of Magic, another one pops up. But, you know, it's, <laughs> but it's a small price to pay um, for, for the overall benefit. Anyway, there's links to all sorts of stuff on here, and go away and have a look at them, and give us your feedback on how we can make them better. That would be great. Um, I'm not going to go into any more detail on that. But the one thing I do want to tell you about, the one thing I want to finish on, uh, is this project, which is called Service Communities. So in order to break down those silos that I showed you earlier, we're bringing together everyone from across government who works on a particular service, some of these people might not have even been in the same room before or know each other's names. Um, and we're trying to create an environment where everyone can collaborate 
to build a service around user needs. Like, trust me, government is not used to working in this way. Um, so this is a tweet from Lou. This was just last week. Um, and this was at the kickoff workshop for the cross-government community for starting a business. Um, and I think in the room, there was around 12 departments there, all mapping out what is it, what is all the stuff that we do as departments across this user journey for starting a business? There was post-its everywhere, but it was very exciting. And we, um, you know, we got together, and we got these people together so that we can all improve this service together. Because at its most basic, as service designers, we're looking at how we get all the right people talking to each other to make change happen so that we can get to a situation that looks a bit more like this, where all services are shaped around user needs and government is shaped by the user-focused services it provides. And if we can get to that, then building better services will in, in turn help us to build a better government. Thank you. Hi, Kate. Hey. Thank you. Uh, some questions. Uh, Anonymous asks... It better not be about Brexit. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> Designers always look at competing products. Uh, do you look at like Estonia's fully digital government services and learn from them? So actually... Yeah, we, I, I was with my colleague talking in Estonia last year and we went to visit their digital team. Um, so GDS was the first, but when, it's not like everyone's copying us or doing the same thing that we're doing. So we've set up an international community and we have monthly catch-ups with different governments across the world who are doing things differently so that we can share ideas and collaborate. So, yes. So inspiration can happen Yes, that exactly. Way. Um, the, the first video you showed, the, the one with the, the woman who needed to navigate all that complexity, mm -hmm. um, it triggered some of us in the crowd to wonder, well, how did you, how did you get the legal department to not, to like chill and oh write it in a way that someone without a legal degree could understand it? How yeah, did you navigate that? It's a daily battle even now, um, challenging, uh, the legislation that sits behind, that shapes services. And um, so we, we have legal uh, people working with us a lot of the time, and that's really helpful because then it can be a collaborative process. Um, but we also want to change, I mean, that's, fun, that's how we do it to tackle uh, existing services. But we also want to change the way that policy gets made in the first place for new services so that policy becomes a bit more agile so that the le legal frameworks that are getting written and built uh, are able to be built around user needs as well. So it's a sort of two-pronged attack. I see. <laughs> Thank you for the great talk. Thank you. Congrats. Thanks for listening.